morning, everybody. Uh, so without further ado, we'll move on to the next session, which is the Migrant Voices Panel, which I know many of you look forward to as a way to, um, in a way, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's where we, the policy things we talk about, uh, come to life with the with the real experience, the lived experience of, of migrants. And in this case, for, for this session, we have two really extraordinary guests with us today. On my left, I have Tolu Olabunni, who's a, a Nigerian-born, uh, brought up in the United States. She has a, a very interesting migration story, which I will not, which I will leave it to her to describe. She's also, let's, uh, to, to put it, to be, to be sharp, to be blunt about it, she's a global thinker about migration on the, on the migration board of the World Economic Forum. She's worked uh, advocating for migrants and refugees and internally displaced people. And she's an innovative thinker and determined change maker, all very positive. In 2018, she received an appointment to work with the United Nations Department for Public Information, in particular to help bring the migrant story to the external relations part of the UN, coinciding uh, or just po post IOMs joining the UN system. So um, if you ask Tola what she does and why she does it, she'll often quote John Wesley, to do all the good you can by all the means you can. That's not the whole quote, but I'll leave it at that. And to my right, to your left, Sh uh, Sharif Zanoui is a Kosovo-born architect who's uh, moved to Switzerland age 12, moved at about the same age that Tolu moved to the United States, so they have similar, similar backstories. In his case, to reunite with, her, with his family, Tolu was leaving her family. He is an architect in the canton of Vaud, and he's a dedicated promoter of migrant integration. And I think that is the common theme that you'll find on the panel today, because indeed integration is kind of maybe the big issue, the big unexplored issue out there. So he re he's the president of the Gruyere Albanian Association, which is an initiative to encourage the integration of the Albanian speaking community in Switzerland and to promote mutual understanding between migrants and decision makers. Uh, I would just leave the introductions at that and just suffice it to say is that I am a former journalist, uh, a poacher turned gamekeeper as you might say, and with that, against that background, I think it's certainly worth reflecting on the media landscape that we live in because it's certainly not what it was 10, even five years ago. Um, we are in Geneva, so I think it's appropriate for me to mention Mary Shelley who lived not too far away down the, uh, down, the, down, the, down the lake, and who at the tender age of 18 wrote the novel Frankenstein. So if the media is the gatekeeper of public discourse in many cases, I think with the advent of social, social media in particular and the um, alchemy that has been added to the media landscape, we see a far more out of control process and indeed more troubling landscape which allows for echo chambers and fake news and all sorts of dis disturbance to what was probably a more serene landscape, certainly when I was working in it. So I think that's an interesting topic just to reflect on how can we advocate for the benefits of migration at a time when everything is getting d distorted in the lens and in the mirror. So against that background, I'm going to turn it over to Tolu to introduce herself. Good morning. Uh, Director General, Deputy Director General, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, thank you so much for being here. I truly am honored by the opportunity to speak with you. This is my first time being back in Switzerland since I was a child. Back then, I was ignorant of what it took to get from Africa to Europe, uh, not the security bestowed on me by my passport, nor the convenience and safety afforded me by air travel. Now, as an adult and as one of the estimated 244 million international migrants in the world, I am back in Switzerland with an immense appreciation for the privilege and the cost of moving freely and safely around the world. I am a migrant and my migration journey has presented me with unequal amounts of adversity and triumph. I was born in Lagos, Nigeria, and when I was barely a teenager, I moved to the United States without my parents. I left behind the comfort of the familiar and the constant embrace of family in pursuit of a better life and the realization of my childhood dream of becoming an engineer. 
Once in the United States, I reveled in the privileges afforded me by my new home and chased after my childhood dream. I worked hard in school, earned my way into a top university, and graduated with a degree in chemical engineering. But then I found myself unable to work in my chosen profession because of the limitations of my immigration status. You see, along the way, I had inadvertently lost my legal immigration status and become undocumented, or you may prefer, I became an irregular migrant. From the moment that that happened, from that moment and truly for many more years than I wish to recount, I was forced into what I call living in the gray, the colorless existence of the paperless, shrouded in fear and hidden in the shadows. I spent every hour of every single day forced to submit my ambition to the limits placed on me by my undocumented status. Desperate, I consulted about a half a dozen immigration attorneys and soon realized that my situation, like that of millions of other young people who were also brought to the United States as children, could only best be addressed by a change to current law a change to the means by which migrants in the United States can access legal status after falling out of status. Untrained in policy or politics, I had the option of leaving my fate to people endlessly more powerful than me, people who have never lived my reality. But change makers and policy makers, hoping to address the challenges faced by migrants cannot afford to lean solely on statistics and secondhand accounts that leave room for political posturing, which far too often contradict the economic and social realities of people on the move. In a world where migration without fear, absent traffickers and smugglers, and removed from leaky boats and deadly border crossings is a privilege reserved for a chosen few, a world where leaving your home country to seek safety, shelter, and opportunity to live your best life and contribute to our world is determined by having the right pieces of paper. There was, for me, a clear choice between being part of the solution or unintentionally complicit in the struggles facing our world. As I watched my highly sought after degree collecting dust, as I watched moments of joy lost to frustration, innovation lost to a lack of access, and too many years of love and laughter lost to frustration. I resolved to be the change that I wanted to see in the world. But what I did not know is that that choice would require a, st a strength that I could not have imagined I had and that it would give back to me what I had long lost, hope. I was the first and only undocumented immigrant in Washington, D.C., volunteering full-time, advocating for the DREAM Act. This is legislation aimed at granting legal status to young immigrants like me who have grown up in the United States, most of us with little memory of our birth country, all of us American in every way but paperwork. In just a few years, I went from an unemployed, undocumented chemical engineer to introducing President Obama in the White House when the U.S. Senate took up a bill I had helped draft. I founded and led several organizations and campaigns, and in recognition of my work, I made the World Economic Forum's list of outstanding women entrepreneurs and was named one of 15 women changing the world. I will never forget the day that a United States Senator said about my life and work, her misfortune has been our good fortune. My absolute favorite African proverb says, until the lion learns to write, all the stories will glorify the hunter. In 2009, I, along with my coalition of the willing, gave rise to advocacy in the United States where those directly affected by a broken immigration system unveiled the lives lived in the shadows of statistics and innuendos. Dreamers, named for the DREAM Act, decimated the false narrative 
of undocumented immigrants as a monolithic group of uneducated and ill-engaged individuals and revealed a diverse, committed, commanding, and relatable group of immigrants. Our voices shattered myths, misconceptions, and ignited a nation's consciousness. Our stories, told in our own words, empowered allies, policymakers, to make arguments for reform rooted in reality and backed by human connection. Together, we taught the lion to write. In our world, where the politics of migration is volatile, and often divorced from reality, migrants are too often stripped of their humanity and lost in the rhetoric. When it comes to migration and for the benefit of integration, exposure to the struggle and triumphs of migrants and re refugees and displaced people is absolutely necessary. My story of migration with its twists, turns, and uncertainties has served as a source of hope for me and for many others. Hope that tells you that you matter. Hope that tells you that you can make a difference and your presence means something. Hope that allowed me to turn a crisis in my life into a career that inspires thousands. It is now my sincere hope that my presence at this IOM Council gives you a glimpse into what is possible when we offer migrants, refugees, and displaced people the freedom to realize their full potential. Humanity wins when all people are free from negative misperceptions and attitudes that lead to ineffective and often inhumane policies. Attitudes and policies that divide rather than unite and leave our world worse for not protecting the vulnerable or reaping the benefits of the free and safe movement of people. In the face of the transnational phenomenon that is international migration, each of us must recognize our rec necessary roles. Commit to use your access, time, talent, and treasure in support of others. And know that allegiance to truth and justice requires getting uncomfortable in support of the voiceless. And if I may leave you with one last thing, Always remember that although our purpose may be beyond our capacity to imagine, it is never beyond our capacity to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tolu, for those inspiring words. And if I may, as a communicator, say that your loss to the chemical engineering world is our gain in the communication space. So those of you who haven't already joined at the, uh, or seen at the exhibition outside on inter internally displaced people, Tola has given us the voiceover and indeed one of the most poignant stories is from Bagu in northern Nigeria. Uh, thank you for that and uh, indeed the issue of credible voices in this very turbulent landscape is so important to us. And with that, uh, without further ado, I'll turn to Sharif uh, to, to tell us a little bit of his story and and how you interlock with, with uh, Toulouse. Uh, Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs, Monsieur le Directeur Général, Monsieur Noël, merci pour cette invitation. Alors, euh, je vais vous faire une petite présentation euh, me concernant et concernant ma communauté. Ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est que Tout commence dans les années 70. Euh, la Suisse connaît un développement économique après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale incroyable et naturellement elle a besoin de main d'œuvre. Et cette main d'œuvre, elle vient de l'Italie, de l'Espagne, du Portugal et des Balkans. Euh, après un accord bilatéral entre, dans les années 70 entre Berne et Belgrade, la Suisse a besoin de main d'œuvre, de force de travail. Et de l'autre côté, on a besoin de liquidité, d'argent. Donc, on va chercher, euh, finalement, euh, les gens sur place, en bus, en train. Et euh, parmi ces gens-là, il y avait mon père. Euh, mon père est venu en Suisse en 1979. Et depuis, euh, depuis ce jour-ci, ou depuis cette année-là, euh, il a toujours vécu ici en Suisse et a travaillé dans le bâtiment. Et nous, les enfants, nous étions encore au Kosovo, puisque finalement, la Suisse avait besoin de travailleurs. Donc, c'était des saisonniers. Et leur présence dans le territoire suisse était éphémère. Donc, euh, 
Ils vivaient au jour le jour, tous les trois mois, tous les six mois. Allez, on poussait jusqu'à une année, et puis ça se prolongeait. Et ça continue ainsi. Euh, Jusqu'en 89, quand le Kosovo se vit retirer son autonomie. Et c'est là que la situation a commencé à se compliquer. Euh, C'est-à-dire, les profs étaient maltraités. Je ne vais pas rentrer dans la politique parce que ce n'est pas mon sujet de prédilection. La situation se dégradait fortement et naturellement, les parents qui étaient en tant que saisonniers ici en Suisse et travaillaient se rendaient compte que finalement, le futur ne s'annonçait pas comme ils l'auraient espéré, c'est-à-dire retourner et construire finalement le pays. Et finalement, il y a... La réunification familiale, c'est-à-dire nous, les enfants, avec la mère, nous sommes arrivés en Suisse en 1991. Ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est que jusqu'en 1991, euh, on avait un père, j'avais un père, mais finalement, je le voyais deux semaines par année, c'est-à-dire l'absence du père. C'est quand même terrible dans le développement d'un enfant. Il euh, y a toujours mieux, il y a toujours pire. Ça, c'est ma situation. Donc, ça forme. Finalement, ça développe. Ça fait ce qu'on est. Non, non, tiens, on arrive en Suisse. Notre père, naturellement, nous dit, écoutez, vous allez venir pour deux semaines. Finalement, c'était des vacances. Super, joyeux, on vient ici. Une semaine passe, deux semaines, super. On va retourner parce que finalement, c'est un environnement qu'on ne connaît pas. On ne connaît rien, ni langue ni culture, pas d'amis, rien. Il n'y a qu'une personne, finalement, qui était contente d'être là, c'était nous, sachant que c'était des vacances, et le père, finalement, qui retrouvait ses enfants et sa famille. Et puis, après deux semaines, naturellement, le père prend la décision de nous inscrire à l'école. Et c'est là que j'ai compris que, finalement, notre futur... À l'âge de 12 ans, vous savez, on a déjà bien grandi. Hein. On, a, on connaît de la langue, on a des amis, on, on s'est habitué à un environnement. Et lorsqu'on arrive là, et on, a, on, on nous apprend que finalement, notre, notre futur, ce sera cet environnement-là, bah, je n'ai pas pris la même chose que ma sœur et mon frère. J'ai pris complètement différemment. Pendant deux semaines, je pleurais tous les jours à l'école, parce que finalement, je ne voulais pas être là. Ce n'était pas mon environnement. Enfin, je ne m'amusais pas. Enfin, vous voyez. Et finalement, il a fallu s'adapter. Il a fallu s'adapter. Et puis, euh, en allant à l'école, finalement, notre seul moyen véritable d'intégration, c'était la, fré euh, la fré fréquentation, finalement, des, des, des collègues, des amis, des, des copains de classe. Et puis, euh, et naturellement, c'était très difficile. C'est-à-dire, eux, ils suivaient un cursus tout à fait normal avec tous les cours, etc. Nous, on suivait finalement des cours de français, d'apprentissage des mots, alors qu'on était déjà bien avancé dans l'âge. Et euh, c'est ainsi qu'il a fallu travailler beaucoup plus et dur pour essayer de rattraper, essayer de rattraper ou de faire quelque chose. Ce qu'il faut savoir, c'est qu'ici en Suisse, on a un système de, finalement d'orientation hein, par, par échelle, finalement, dire voilà, toi tu es fait plutôt pour être là, toi, plutôt pour être là, selon le système de notes et d'orientation professionnelle, etc. Et finalement, on ne connaît pas véritablement le potentiel de la personne. On, se juge, on finalement on juge les notes. Et je ne suis pas spécialiste là-dedans, mais ce que je sais, c'est que ça n'a pas marché chez moi. Donc finalement, j'avais la prétention de faire un apprentissage qui était plutôt dans le dessin, dans le bâtiment ou l'informatique. Finalement, je me suis orienté dans la même profession que mon père. Ça veut dire que je voyais mon père physiquement travailler pour 30 personnes tous les jours et venir à la maison et ne pas dire un mot. Mais vous savez, on n'a pas besoin de parler. Le visage dit tout. Les yeux disent tout. Et ça, c'était extrêmement... C'est-à-dire, euh, cette, cette perception, cette, euh, la, cette, euh, la captation de ces ondes, finalement, m'a beaucoup affecté, m'a développé, finalement, dans ce sens-là. Et... Euh, Finalement, j'ai dû me résigner à faire un apprentissage qui était dans le bâtiment, physique, comme mon père. J'avais des ambitions, moi, et finalement, ça ne correspondait pas du tout à l'orientation dans laquelle je voulais aller. 
ce que je vous explique là, je suis une des personnes parmi tant de jeunes, finalement, qui ont dû passer par là. Finalement, j'ai fait l'apprentissage, j'ai continué avec la maturité. Ensuite, j'avais euh, l'architecture me plaisait. Finalement, j'ai découvert quelque chose au hasard hein, et j'ai continué. J'ai fait euh, un bachelor et un master. Voilà, ça, c'est côté professionnel. Euh, ensuite, je me suis euh, étant étant le produit finalement euh, d'une société, d'une migration euh, et de, de la comment dirais-je de, de la constatation finalement du système et des solutions mises en place pour une intégration, euh, je me suis senti dans le devoir de m'engager pour la société en général et particulièrement ma communauté puisque je la connaissais mieux que quiconque et euh, c'était un devoir moral finalement de m'engager là-dedans chose que j'ai faite et euh, ensuite je me suis engagé dans différentes commissions communales et cantonales. Voilà, moi je pense que je vais m'arrêter là pour ma présentation. So before we open it up to the audience, I just thought some reflections and maybe some engagement with our colleagues here. But these two stories seem to tell us that uh, the, the story of migration that many of us maybe carry in our head from reading media, watching media, listening to the dramas. These are really quite different stories. These are stories of really some triumph over adversity and of the, you know, there's, if there's a view abroad that migrants are all so keen to come here, actually it's a story of loneliness and struggle as much as it is of a new life. And I think um, it's worth reflecting on that as we, as, we, as we live in these turbulent times, to coin a phrase, where increasingly, the, you know, there's a, a resentment building up in society. It's e easy for populist politicians to make uh, political hay out of issues real or imagined. And I'd like to just ask, um, since so many of us in this public space, in this, uh, in this space, struggle with the idea, uh, with the notion of a rational discourse about migration, a rational discourse about the benefits that migrants can bring to society, how do these two folks uh, advise us what do they think is the correct path if we are to have a more balanced discussion? Tolu, can I turn to you? Thank you. Well, you know, migration is a complex issue, but without a doubt. Uh, there are benefits, there are drawbacks, as there, as there is with a thousand other things, with technology, with globalization. Um, but there is a need for us to recognize that migration has always been a part of human existence and a necessary part of human existence. And it will continue to be a part of uh, our development and growth as, as a country, as a nation, as a world. Uh, it is necessary for us to be interconnected. Where I've seen that we often fall short, and, and I did this in, in my work, where I, I, I went in and started uh, top down. I started with wanting to change policy and soon realized uh, that change, particularly change that may not be considered politically expedient, does not come from the top down, it comes from the bottom up. And I went from very very focused policy advocacy and drafting of legislation to working directly on the grassroots level and with people. Um, and so looking at migration through the lens of changing hearts and minds. Numbers and statistics and all of this information that we throw at people, they're necessary and they have their place, but we have to start with connecting as people. When we do that, then it's easier to break down the walls, to understand um, our fears, our anxieties, our hopes and dreams, and start from there, connect one person to another, connect a community together, connect a society together, and now enshrine that in policy and legislation that allows us to move forward effectively. Thank you, Thank you Tolu. I mean, those uh, of you who are familiar with the humanitarian sector know that wherever there is a project dealing with people who've been displaced, uh, uh, refugees, the Rohingya in Cox's Bazar, for example, written into the project from the outset is 40%, 50% of the resource goes to the host community. Because the one important thing is that in helping one vulnerable group, you don't kick off uh, uh, the antibodies of reaction 
in another community that suddenly feels that they're being overlooked, bypassed, or whatever. And maybe there's a lesson in that for 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 those for the receiving countries, if you like, to make sure and be over, overly aware and conscious of this of the feelings of those who either are or perceive that they've been left behind in the race towards globalization. And maybe that's something we can turn to Sharif on. The um, how do you work? How, what, is, what, is the, what is the responsibility, if you like, also of the migrant to integrate, to become part of the society without losing their integ integrity, without losing their identity? Yes. Alors, ce qui est important est de savoir, c'est que dès qu'on commence à voir finalement l'autre comme un danger, parce qu'il est différent, c'est perdu d'avance. Ce qu'il faudrait, c'est voir l'autre en tant que richesse, euh, dans ce sens où euh, on ne peut pas venir avec des projets d'intégration sans prendre les sujets, entre guillemets, en considération. Ça veut dire qu'on doit travailler main dans la main avec des projets concrets. Finalement, vous savez, les gens euh, en bas, si, euh, pour parler simplement, sont fatigués des beaux discours. Ils sont fatigués de ça, ils ne veulent pas de ça. Ce qu'ils veulent, c'est des projets concrets sur le terrain, euh, de travailler ensemble, de, de construire quelque chose ensemble et surtout de se connaître. Parce que finalement, le premier regard, quand je vous regarde, j'ai un préjugé. C'est tout à fait naturel de se dire euh, la personne pourrait être ainsi, comme ça, etc. Et c'est souvent, c'est les médias qui véhiculent une fausse image sur des, un pourcentage très petit et finalement, toute la communauté ramasse. Et c'est Concrètement, c'est une collaboration euh, pour la mise en place de systèmes concrets. Et euh, pour ça, dans le, parce que j'ai beaucoup été, été et suis actif dans le canton de Fribourg, et pour ça, je dois, je dois avouer qu'on a fait un progrès euh, considérable. So, uh, just would, perhaps one more round and then turn it to the audience. But Tolu, when the media get it wrong, and in this era of clickbait, my goodness, they are incentivized to get it wrong. What's the appropriate response? What should we do? Communicate. Uh, I think you know there are far too many people who turn off their brains um, and look to others to feed them information uh, and don't bother to investigate or filter. Uh, a lot of us are getting our news from a single source uh, or maybe just two sources uh, that are interconnected and interlinked in some way. There needs to be an effort to Ordinarily, yes, we should not have to investigate what the media tells us or the images that we are shown. Uh, but in our world, there is a necessity for you to question what you're giving. Uh, and even if it is true, there are always multiple sides to a story, right? And so understanding the story might go beyond just the angle that you have been presented, even if the angle is not false. But a lot of times, yes, clickbait, uh, you know, showing outrageous uh, images is, is resulting in, in more turmoil on, on this issue uh, than, than than helping to resolve the problems that we have. Uh, and so, you know, as Sharif has done on, on a very local level and as I've done with engaging young people uh, around the world is focus on creating safe spaces for those that are aligned and those that are opposed to have dialogue, to have conversation. And once you do that, and once you realize the lives lived uh, uh, behind the issues that are being talked about in sound bites, you are empowered to seek truth even when it is being spoon-fed to you. Thank you. I'm sure if, it, do, can you point to an example where you have been confronted with, um, let's call it the ugly side of, of life, where you're dealing with uh, xenophobia or you're dealing with somebody who maybe has a completely wrong perception of where you're coming from, and how you or your colleagues have managed to turn that around into a more productive conversation? Uh, uh, pardon, j'ai tendance à parler anglais. Alors, uh, il, y a, il y a énormément de situations. Finalement, on, on, est, uh, on, est, um, on, on est très mal à l'aise. Je voudrais juste citer une situation uh, de Amin Malouf. Uh, C'est notre regard qui enferme souvent les autres dans leur plus étroite appartenance. Et c'est notre regard aussi qui peut les libérer. 
Euh, ça, c'est extrêmement important parce que finalement, le regard peut être un regard finalement d'acceptation ou de refoulement. De refoulement. Et ça, c'est très important. Et euh, quand on a compris ça, en fait, moi, personnellement, comment j'ai euh, agi pour évoluer et me libérer surtout de ça, c'était de me dire, je me suis dit, personnellement, c'est il fallait que j'aide, finalement, la société à mettre en place, leur apprendre, finalement, comment est-ce qu'il fallait faire pour intégrer les gens. Je ne pouvais pas attendre que ça vienne d'eux. Il fallait que ça vienne de ce côté-là. Pourquoi Parce qu'à force de justement être confronté à des situations de stigmatisation et euh, de jugement. Je vais raconter juste un exemple, puisque vous m'en demandez un. Euh, je venais de finir mon bachelor et euh, j'avais gagné un prix euh, pour mon projet. Euh, naturellement, le journal local euh, m'avait euh, consacré un article. Euh, bah, ma famille, naturellement, la communauté est très fière. Et euh, j'ouvre le journal, il euh, y a l'article, et juste en dessous, il y avait un fait divers. Et ça, c'était extrêmement blessant. C'est-à-dire, j'avais travaillé pendant des années, pour, euh, pas pour l'article, finalement, je m'en foutais de ça. C'était pour... Il euh, y avait un effort qui était reconnu, et puis juste en dessous, un fait divers. Vous voyez, finalement, dans les médias, je ne sais pas vous, mais je ne vois pas souvent de bonnes nouvelles. Hein. Donc... Euh, donc ça, c'est quelque chose de très blessant, finalement. Donc, euh, construire quelque chose, il faut énormément de temps. Déconstruire une fraction de seconde. Et ça, c'est très important. Thank you very much, Philippe. We have very little time left, I'm being signaled to, but uh, we would really welcome any interventions from the floor if, it, if, uh, if you've got any questions for the panelists. Indeed, indeed. Indeed. Um, finally, the, the, the way forward. So the, how do we, how do, in, a, in a landscape where politics is changing people's views, how can we concretely rally to that? Do, how do we engage with those who uh, seem to be taking advantage of the situation in a constructive way, in, in as short a time as you can manage? Absolutely. Uh, you know, shifting hearts and minds really is where is is where this starts. Shifting culture is where this starts. Uh, combating xenophobia by opening our hearts and minds to the other and moving, shifting from uh, a world of us versus them uh, to to an us and understanding the necessary the necessity of, of migrants and migration, the positive aspects, and also recognizing that there are some challenges. All of that, I think, is an excellent place to start. Sherif, do you have any final remarks for us? Yes, mais, uh, oui, peut-être j'aurais une remarque et surtout un, un exemple à, à prendre. Um, C'est là où j'ai um, été actif, c'est-à-dire dans, dans le canton de Fribourg, euh, je vais parler surtout d'une commission qui est une initiative, finalement, euh, c'est une initiative citoyenne, en fait, qui a été prise à Bulle, et, et, et c'est une commission qui s'appelle Bulle Sympa. Et Bulle Sympa, en fait, cette initiative citoyenne, c'est une plateforme intermédiaire entre les autorités politiques et la population. Et ça, je dois avouer que c'est quelque chose de formidable, parce qu'il euh, y a tous les représentants qui sont autour d'une table et euh, finalement on, on œuvre pour la société. Il y a toutes sortes de projets, un lampadaire qui ne fonctionne pas, etc. Puis on transmet à, à, aux autorités. Finalement, c'est la voix du peuple à travers cette plateforme. Et ça, je trouve que c'est super. Et ça, il y a aussi au niveau cantonal pour tout, tous les districts. Et il faudrait partir depuis en bas pour pouvoir quelque chose, pour pouvoir construire en fait. Ça, c'est mon point de vue personnel. Great. Well, thank you both for your contributions. If I can just maybe very briefly sum up, I think one of the lessons is that we have to engage. We have to not be pushed back by defeat. And that really success comes in micro ways. In, in individual success uh, is terribly important for sending an, uh, a message through your peers, through society. And one misstep can be, 
can create terrible damage. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's certainly not an easy road, but uh, thank you very much, both of you, for your inspiring contributions today. Thank you. Thank you.